and welcome Welcome to the American Academy. I'm Lindsay Harris, the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of the School of Classical Studies here at the Academy. And on behalf of our director, Dr. Kim Bowes, who is presently in the United States, I am delighted to introduce to you this evening Dr. Thomas Crow, the Rosalie Solo Professor of Modern Art and Associate Provost for the Arts at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. Dr. Crow is presently the James S. Ackerman Scholar in Residence at the American Academy where he is at work on several writing projects that we can look forward to reading in the months ahead. These include his forthcoming No Idols, The Missing Theology of Art, which treats, serious, treats seriously the often overlooked role of religion in modern art. And he is also working on the publication of his Andrew W. Mellon lecture series delivered at the National Gallery of Art in 2015, which addressed uh, European art in the immediate wake of revolution and empire, titled Restoration as Event and Idea, Art in Europe, 1814 to 1820. The professorships and forthcoming publications I've just mentioned are but the latest in Dr. Crow's long and impressive record of accomplishments in the field of modern and contemporary art. Before his appointment in 2007, Dr. Crow was the director of the Getty Research Institute, professor of art history at the University of Southern California, and prior to that, the Robert Lehman Professor of the History of Art at Yale. His scholarship on modern and contemporary art has earned numerous honors, including the Eric Mitchell Prize for the best first book in the history of art, as well as the Charles Rufus Morey Prize of the College Art Association. More recently, he was the recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, as well as a Michael Hawley Fellowship at the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute. In fact, I'm hard pressed to think of an accolade in the history of art that Dr. Crow has not earned in his illustrious career as a scholar. To be an historian of modern and contemporary art connotes different sets of expertise in different contexts. In the case of Dr. Crow, we're talking about the long view of modern culture with a capital C. His numerous books on the interaction between artistic creation and social circumstance have broken new ground in our understanding of everything from painting and culture in 18th century France to the work of the immensely influential young sculptor Gordon Maddock Clark and his circle of artists in 1970s New York City. Uh, his most recent publication, The Long March of Pop, Art, Music, and Design from 1930 to 1995, which came out last year, is a tour de force re-examination of a pivotal development in 20th century art, namely the symbiosis between the avant-garde and mass culture known more commonly as pop. As the subtitle of his book su suggests, Dr. Crow in this study not only vastly expands what we conceive of as pop art, extending his analysis from American folk art to Jeff Koons, but he also contextualizes art within the world of high and low culture writ large, scrutinizing the relationship of music and design uh, with regard to, to popular culture with the same rigor he affords to visual art. It was in the context of this study that Dr. Crow took the opportunity to revisit his long-standing interest in the art of Robert, Ra Robert Rauschenberg, the American artist celebrated above all for his combines. This form of three-dimensional collage Mary's quotidian objects, such as a bed or a feather, with the stuff of history, photographs, newspaper clippings, or even allusions to the grand traditions of art history that these objects sought at once to advance as well as to undermine. Dr. Crow begins this, his chapter in this book uh, discussing Robert Ra uh, Rauschenberg's combines with an account of the artist's now legendary trip taken in 1952 to Italy and North Africa with his friend and fellow artist Cy Twombly. This trip, which brought Rauschenberg to Rome and Florence for the first time, laid the foundation for the artist's lifelong fascination with classical myth, which will form the subject of Dr. Crow's lecture this evening. We are de delighted to hear his thoughts on this topic at present at the Academy, as they offer compelling contributions to our uh, current programming. First, many of you will recall the exhibition organized in our galleries last fall by my great friend and colleague, uh, Peter Benson Miller, the Academy's art director, on the photographs of Cy Twombly, who, as I mentioned, was a critical interlocutor for Rauschenberg on his Italian journey. Second, tonight's lecture uh, on how one of the most important ar American artists of the 20th century responded to classical myth is a pillar of a series of events we've organized this year titled American Classics. This set of lectures, conversations, conferences, and exhibitions reconsiders the classic ideas, texts, and works of art that define American identity today, perhaps today of all days, uh, also explores 
uh, the resonance of the ancient world in ancient culture, particularly as it is forged abroad. Lastly, we are pleased to collaborate on tonight's event with the Visual Studies Rome Network. This partnership speaks to the Academy's role in the city as part of a group of centers that foster new scholarship in Rome about visual art and culture. And we are fortunate indeed to be able to highlight tonight the latest ideas on these subjects uh, as expressed by Dr. Crow, whose lecture tonight is entitled Rauschenberg and the Need for Myth. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Well, many, many thanks for that really kind and, and uh, warm introduction, Lindsay. And uh, I certainly want to thank everyone at the Academy, Kim and Absentia, Lindsay, Peter, anyone who had uh, anything to do with my being invited here, because it's just proved to be uh, just more than I'd imagined as a, an extraordinary place to work. And it sort of sent me back you know, you have heard just now that uh, uh, this talk uh, follows from published work on Rauschenberg, his trip to Italy, myth, his relation to Twombly, and so on. But I sat down and ended up, I think, writing the story in a different way than I've ever told it before, and I feel already something about the being here and only less than a week of, of, of uh, exposure to Rome at this, uh, on this you know, uh, instance uh, has entered into what I'm going to try to talk about tonight. Now we can begin with a kind of fuzzy image where, from 1958, where we see Bob Rauschenberg in his New York studio surrounded by works of his, all of them now famous, beyond famous, in the art world, works he had been accumulating over the previous four years. Suspended somewhere between painting and sculpture, as Lindsay has already um, uh, indicated, he gave them uh, their own artistic category. The, the name points to their seeming omnivorousness, such that no element or found object could be ruled out for inclusion in one of these constructions, up to and including the aforementioned stuffed animal or an entire mattress encased in sheets and quilt. But the artist's seemingly dejected pose might have been motivated by the condition implied in his having amassed all these works, specifically the fact that all of them were still in his possession. After nearly a decade of uh, exhibiting and quite uh, high visibility, uh, he had sold barely any of his art. While the career of his then partner, Jasper Johns, had taken off at the beginning of that same year, 58. But in the long run, there was some consolation. This accumulation of unsold pieces helped him refine a distinct logic and vocabulary of art making, which I think has given his, this body of work its enduring currency. But it needs saying at the outset that the nature of their logic and their subsequent power, I think has been felt by most people rather than completely understood. Because they appear composed of detritus from the moment of their creation, it's been overlooked how vital their classical inheritance has been to the kind of sense that they actually make. Now, it's this piece out of this whole array 
that bookends this entire phase of Rauschenberg's career from 1954 to 1958, which are actually its dates. Greatest identifiable elements on its various surfaces date from the year of the photograph. But he counted the piece as his first combine, the instigator of his entire personal genre, and probably, be, probably began working on it late in 1954. Now, if we zero in on any zone from that dominant elevated front panel, this is from near the top, as the red line indicates, the assembled bits and pieces of imagery seem to defy any evident logic. A clipped out photograph of soldiers running in the midst of grounded parachutes filled by the wind. Below what seems to be some sort of misty graveyard. Adjacent to these is a newspaper clipping, brown with age, which I've circled, announcing the 25th wedding anniversary of Dora and Ernest Rauschenberg, that is, the parents of the artist. But this scrap is affixed on the panel um, too high for it to be legible when peering upwards from a normal viewing position as the piece is some two and a quarter meters in height. However, in the artist's working process, that tiny aging relic of bonding and of parentage sets in motion a chain of associations along those two vectors. In an unmissable position, just at eye level, is an affecting child portrait, overexposed in a way that lends it an angelic appearance. The subject is Rauschenberg's son, Christopher, the only child of his dissolved marriage to fellow artist Susan Weil. Almost attached to the bottom edge of that portrait, if you just you know, move your eyes down slightly, you'll see this. Reinforcing the theme of beauty across the sexes and generations is a lineup of 1920s bathing beauty contestants, which happens to include the younger self of the child's grandmother, Dora Rauschenberg. And she is placed on a line with a profile portrait photograph of Christopher's mother, Susan Weil herself. Below and to its left is appended a letter in Christopher's own penciled hand, which reads, I hope that you still like me, Bob, because I still love you. Please write me back, write with a W. Love, love, Christopher. And these notations find an echo in some adjacent scrawls by Cy Twombly, uh, scattered with silver stars on the right-hand side of this detail. The male actors in this collage scenario tend to signal pain and loss. Dominating the lower zone is this solitary male in the center who seems lost in some private agony and whose gesture finds itself mirrored in the corresponding gesture by a presumably innocent Puto by Raphael right there. Now, why, though, should this confessional scrapbook matter to anyone else besides the parties involved? How does it rise to the level of art? Well, this question concerned Rauschenberg as well as made evident in his elaboration of the foundational lower register of the combine, which is a larger um, uh, volume which supports the surmounting panel above. 
Now, he may have been clowning around when this photograph was taken on exhibition of the piece at Eleanor Ward's Stable Gallery, but I think it indicates something about culture that has some serious import for his own sense of identity. Now, the work was and has remained officially untitled, has gained or gone under other names. The artist himself used to call it Plymouth Rock after the breed of the stuffed chicken. It's a whimsical inclusion, seemingly, until one reflects on the paradox that is inherent in any flightless bird. A paradox we've already encountered in the grounded parachutes at the top of the combine. And the other name for the piece in common currency is the man with the white shoes. After a photograph of an immaculate figure, a kind of southern debutante's bow from the 1920s maybe, who occupies that vertical flat panel flanking the lower cavity of the whole upright double box structure. But why not the man in the white suit? Seems to be more self-evident. But you can find the reason for the nickname by going around the opposite side of the piece to look into the hollow cavity at its rear. And there, on an eye-level platform, sits an isolated pair of shoes smothered in white gesso. The bleached starkness of the pigment all the more dramatic for the black painted muslin with which the whole interior is lined. Once discovered, the shoes in their funereal comportment lend the whole construction the air of a reliquary or a votive shrine. But the memorial is, if anything, a pagan one. Few careful viewers of the man with the white shoes combined have failed to recall the myth of Narcissus when confronted by the immaculate gentleman caller poised over the mirror that covers the platform at his feet. And that mythic association, which might otherwise remain no more than a suggestion, gained solidity through two adjacent features of the work's complicated structure. First, there were the actual white shoes. Reckoned in relation to the dandy's photograph, they become the physical remnant of some accident or catastrophe. Recall that Narcissus, in punishment for cruelly spurning the nymph Echo, became uh, the victim of his own enchanting beauty, wasting away in futile infatuation with his own reflection until his eventual transformation into the flower that bears his name and from which we, of course, derive the clinical term narcissism. Well, then, a look down into the same mirror, just from a different angle, reveals another apparition of beauty personified. That reflection arrives from the underside of the adjacent cavity up above the chicken and requires some deciphering when you first see it because its printed legend is backwards in the mirror. But if you kind of crouch down and peer upwards, as did the person who took this photograph, namely me, uh, reveals a, this handbill from the Louisiana Yam Festival of 1953. Uh, emblazoned with the image of its chosen Yamboli queen, one Janet Rauschenberg, uh, the sister of the artist, 10 years his junior. The contest of female beauty invoked by this triumph of the artist's own kin shows up, depending on the viewer's position, in, as I said, in that same reflective surface as the blandly handsome male figure. Is this a judgment of Paris with the yam standing in for the apple? The contest of beauty announced above 
you know, higher up on the combine that we've already seen, um, which includes the mother of Janet Rauschenberg joined together under this rubric of beauty competition. Uh, uh, reinforces the, you know, the implication of the, of the, you know, uh, upside down poster. And that doubling could shift the blandly handsome young man from the more obvious Narcissus to the character of Paris, whose temerity in judging among three goddesses brought down such terrible ruin on the world. Well, the appearance of Rauschenberg's combine, or really any of his combines, defies any conventional notion of the beautiful, of order, of symmetry, of you know, any of its conventional attributes. It plainly aimed to explore the idea and the enticements of beauty with all its intermingled consolations and perils. It's a running thread Rauschenberg finds in making sense of his own family history and his conflicted current existence. Well, beauty as such lay beyond his reach as an artist, as, as it would for just about any artist of our times. There will never be a modern Praxiteles or a 20th century Canova. To be credible, the theme of beauty would need to be expressed, as Rauschenberg does, by its visual opposite, by the awkward and ungainly. But containing within that uh, uh, you know, opposed visual repertoire, the, the mythological agents of beauty as such, as handled and understood by the Greeks and the Romans. Now, I just want to assert here that an advanced understanding of myth regards the narrative expression of any particular myth, as say we might find in Ovid's Metamorphoses, as second order rationalizations of nonlinear matrices of signs, signs that behave according to their own transformative logic and then yield the narratives as continual repeated uh, derivatives, let's call them. Now, if one wanted a picture of that underlying atemporal matrix, something beyond a reductive diagram in an anthropology textbook, Rauschenberg's combines may prove to be our most searching modern mythological representations. Achieved by his ability to condense the plethora of autobiographical tokens into a few potent symbolic substitutes with vivid classical resonances. He rehearses the ways in which a myth temporarily resolves the otherwise irresolvable contradictions of lived experience, of which Rauschenberg probably had somewhat more than his share. To the extent that one can navigate the autobiographical constellation that I had tried to map out for you, it deepens and motivates the mythic one. But if you can't discern those autobiographical you know, references, it still adds a cloud of mystery and suggestion germane to mythical thinking. But then the question remains, where did this sophistication come from? Not from Rauschenberg's formal education, to be sure, or from any sort of cultivated upbringing. He was raised in the Gulf Coast refinery town of Port Arthur, Texas south of Houston, where his father worked at the local light and power company. At his parents' urging, he briefly studied uh, pharmacology at the University of Texas, but left after a few months to enlist in the Navy, this being at the height of the Second World War. 
stationed in the port city of San Diego. His first exposure to an original work of art, he says, came in 1944 when he made an excursion up to the Huntington Collection, east of Los Angeles, where, of all things, Gainsborough's Blue Boy and Lawrence's Pinky struck him with the desire to become a painter. After his discharge the following year, he drifts for a while before applying his veterans' benefits to attending art school in Kansas City and then at the Académie Julien in Paris. There he meets fellow student Susan Weil, whose likeness you've encountered on the untitled Compine. They return together to New York and shortly both enroll at Black Mountain College, the experimental arts college in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Now this remote place has during those years, it was during those years, probably the epicenter of advanced art. Arts by Americans and emigre Europeans in visual art, design, textiles, architecture, music, photography, poetry. It was one of the places that first really tried to realize a thoroughly intermedia, experimental, cultural ideal. And here, Rauschenberg's real learning begins. And along the way, he's abandoned his given name, Milton, uh, for Bob, which he thought sounded more like an artist. The putatively more dignified Robert, which has become customary, is actually a name he never used. But I would say his specifically classical education flowed from his meeting another young student, namely Cy Twombly, and what followed thoroughly complicated his recent 1950 marriage to Weil. In the summer months of 1951, she came to visit Black Mountain with their newborn son, Christopher, but had departed abruptly after a brief stay. Charles Olson, who was there on the faculty, wrote to fellow poet Robert Creeley about an incident when Rauschenberg swam into the middle of the campus lake resisting Twombly's soothing entreaties that he returned to shore. Oh, what happened? Okay, I can tell you the little anecdote while the, while the PowerPoint's getting fixed. Um, he's in the black just now, Olson continued in this letter. Gee, I wonder why it's doing that. Uh, well, just put up with it. It's a little bit psychedelic, you know, or <laughs> solarized, or so something adds to the obvious deep affect that went into the making of the photograph. He's in the black just now, said Olson. His marriage smashing, probably over the affair with Twombly, his contract with his gallery not renewed, and I'd also bet as an added hidden factor the terrible pressure on him of the clear genius of this lad Twombly, the success of his year, and the total defeat of Bob's." End quote. Now Olson wrote these words during a hiatus just after Rauschenberg had left North Carolina for a stay in New York before coming back to Black Mountain for the spring and summer terms of 51. After an eventful half year during which he cemented his close relationships with composer John Cage and choreographer Merce Cunningham, also visiting Cuba with Twombly over the spring break, the two artists set out in August 1952 on a trip to Italy that would last the better part of a year. Oh, I see it's not specific to that slide, is it? No, this could get a little hair raising. Um, 
Well, it, I'll just pause here for a moment and um, kind of highlight how unusual this was for the two of them to decide to set out for the old world and for Italy in particular. Because the older generation of American artists, the great abstract expressionists, Pollock, Rothko, Franz Klein, to whom Rauschenberg was in fact very close, they didn't travel. You know, they really just hatched whatever they were doing right there in New York. There was no call, they felt no call to do what generations and generations of artists have done who've come to this academy from the United States who wanted to have that contact with the old world. Twombly was underwriting the expenses of their trip with a fellowship that he had uh, obtained from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, Virginia was his home state, awarded to support his stated desire to nourish his art with direct encounters with the traditions of Europe. So this kind of aesthetic pilgrimage, which for them was a departure from the post-war norm, really uh, goes back to the, the, the idea of, of this academy at the turn of the century, but it was something that they had to cobble together on their own. Okay. Um, so what Twombly had uh, pitched to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts effectively became by proxy Rauschenberg's mission as well. And the dialogue with his partner would have been vital in another way, as his learning was always constrained by his dyslexia, which made it difficult for him to process information from books. He tended to rely on absorbing uh, ideas and knowledge from conversation which is one of the things that made him so thoroughly a, a socially animating kind of character. And now he could partake in that among the great monuments. As you, this is a montage that uh, Rauschenberg made using techniques he'd no doubt learned from the stellar group of photographers who were teaching and learning at Black Mountain. Uh, here after their initial arrival by ship in Venice. Photography really at this point, to the extent that we can see it, is um, uh, really in advance of his other art. I mean, he's really quite remarkable. This sequential piece, Sigh on the Spanish Steps. And the two of them naturally did the rounds of the great traditions that Twombly had instanced in his application for funds. Now strains developed over their tight finances. It was really two people trying to, to, uh, to get by on one fellowship. So he, Rauschenberg set off by himself to Morocco, successfully finding construction work to, to generate his own financial support. And it shows really how kind of handy he was based on his Port Arthur upbringing that he could succeed in doing that. During, oh now I'm really afraid of what's gonna happen because we got some art. Um, He produced a remarkable collection of small portable collages on pieces of speckled gray shirt cardboard that he could just, you know, obtain without difficulty and without expense, just uh, arranging bits and pieces of things that he had found that lent themselves to this two-dimensional realization. Twombly joined him towards the end of the North African stay, and they went back to Rome together. And by then, Rauschenberg had found his preferred old world medium. Three-dimensional assemblages he called personal fetishes, like the ones that he's working on here. One early morning, he took them to the Pinchot Gardens, 
and photographed them and stole like ritualistic offerings uh, festooned around the walls and statuary. And at the same time as he was doing these kind of flexible personal fetishes, he also did his personal boxes, which were, hey, that, do that doesn't look too bad. Um, uh, less evocatively named, but I think just as redolent of ritual and magic. Both he and Twombly managed in the spring of 53 the rather remarkable feat of securing gallery exhibitions in both Rome and Florence. Um, for his part, Rauschenberg showed a, a, you know, a, a selection of these uh, emblem-like constructions, some hanging, some enclosed in boxes, composed of small objects chosen in his words. And this is a little excerpt from the TypeScript uh, sort of program he wrote for the show, um, emphasizing that they would uh, uh, be imbued with the richness of their past or their vivid abstract reality. Striking in all of his Italian imagery, both verbal and visual, is the as ascription of some autonomous influence to his materials. And the quasi-independent presences that emerged from their combination, a slightly sinister power that almost outruns his creative authority over them. He invited visitors to submit themselves to the objects in their turn. You may develop, he proposed in the same statement, your own ritual about the objects. Compartments are left empty for you to add bits of your own choice to rearrange the contents or to leave them in their emptiness, which signifies unknown possibilities." End quote. The legend has been that a hostile review after their second exhibition in Florence caused Rauschenberg to throw nearly all of these objects into the Arno. Obeying to the letter the sarcastic instruction of the critic in question, that as he said, they should be thrown into the river, it saved the packing problem, he said at the time. But that literally throw away remark arguably masked a deeper motivation, almost a panicked response to some disquiet engendered by his own creations. When Twombly found himself conscript conscripted into military service at the end of 1953, he and Rauschenberg had been sharing studio space on Fulton Street in New York. And stored in their common space were many more works by Twombly, the sculptures that he'd been fashioning since their return from Italy, works that manifest their own stately mummified silence, a, a masking redolent of ritual and a certain hermetic secrecy from scrap timber, decorative baubles, uh, homely handcraft, uh, 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 reed pipes, wooden spoons, palm frond fans, and other flots. Of, oh, of course, this is supposed to be dead white, as most of the sculptures were, invariably um, uh, encased in loosely applied white gesso, which helped Twombly conjure an unexpected monumentality that defies their relatively modest size. The elemental nature of his materials, because few of them probably would have been unknown to the ancient Romans themselves, uh, lent his simply organized assemblages the air of archeological finds. It's as if Twombly had taken up the materials and mysterious suggestions of antiquity that Rauschenberg had repudiated on the Arno Bridge. The bleached whiteness of these sculptures, for all of their cycladic primitivism, also belonged to a very contemporary dialogue with Rauschenberg. Shortly before their European departure, Rauschenberg's so-called white painting 
which, oh, <laughs> it is white. It's this thing back here, re-exhibited in, uh, in 53, by, again, at the Stable Gallery, had prompted outrage among the older artists in the New York School, that stay-at-home group I was talking about earlier. The white painting had originally been conceived at Black Mountain, a very Black Mountain kind of exercise, uh, in the spirit of John Cage's chance compositional procedures. And Cage praised the white painting for its recept for what, what he liked about it was its receptivity to any plays or accidents of light in the environment. The shadows, the, 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 you know, the illumination would all kind of uh, take up residence on the surface of the white painting, which would have no resistance to them. But at the same time, cage, they also sealed the surface of the canvas, canvas with impersonally uniform rolling like rolled paint, like a house painter would cover a surface without any sort of personal inflection. Um, you know, it's so difficult to see this. I don't know whether I'll even call attention to Twombly's painting, one example of which is there in the background amidst these other sculptures of the kind that I was just describing. Maybe it's better to go back to the Rauschenberg and talk about the, these sculptures in the foreground, which are sort of his accompaniment to what Twombly was doing, but with much less effect. Rauschenberg called them elemental, and they forego all the textures and intimacies of his Italian phase, while the paintings behind them, whether the crusty black one over here, or the smooth rolled white one over here, um, either empty out or cover over any equivalent complications. Now his retiring and kind of diffident pose appears congruent with these qualities, which contrast to the confident flowering of Twombly's output during this same period. By the end of 1954, however, something clicked for Rauschenberg, and the decade-long combine era began. Why that happened exactly would be a complex question. Cage and Merce Cunningham were offering strong encouragement, and the fact that Jasper Johns had taken Twombly's place in his affective life might also provide some part of the answer, but perhaps too ready an answer. But explode they did, the combines, with almost all of their salient attributes present from the beginning, inaugurated by the untitled example we've spent so much time on. But some significant refinements can still be discerned, and these all tended towards the classical. What is this going to look like? OK, you can see something there. This work, Painting with a Gray Wing, remains comparatively little known. But I find it very important, even key. Maybe it's the fact that it's really flat, tightly constructed, um, which seems too close to an easel painting, rather than a more expansive, uh, uh, you know, less uh, controlled or seemingly controlled kinds of works that Rauschenberg is best known for. The, the titular motif of the work, a down-pointing feather, which is, has acquired this flame-like red tip, it is right there. Um, encapsulates both the lift into flight and the fall to earth. Um, the skeins of paint, which I've got maybe a better close up here, the skeins of paint that he's wrapped around it, these are not strings, but bits of paint, but they have the effect of 
string, something tying or constraining. Um, uh, introduces a theme of binding. And the act of binding itself entails both ascent going up and descent going down. As Rauschenberg underlines below by this partly obscured collage element depicting demonic human flyers soaring in winged contraptions. The source is Goya's print series, Los Disparates, and it's titled Modo de Volar, Way of Flying. Emphatic strokes of brightly colored oil paint converge on another flight motif, small but kind of key, which I've encircled in red. It's an old-fashioned American mercury dime, um, which equates flight with divinity, with freedom from mortal limitations, rather than with the human depravity of Goya's print. And despite its minuscule dimensions, the entire orchestration of the composition draws the viewer's attention to this small worn coin. You've got these streaks of paint converging on it so that somehow you're never gonna miss it. Just nearby, two photographs recount a sequence in which an athletic young man practices some exercise under a sternly watchful older man standing in the background, his hat pulled low over his brow. The photographs are covered with a light wash so that we can't really make out the features of the young man, but the ideal androgynous, androgynous uh, profile on the coin lends itself as a ready surrogate and marks the soaring flight of youthful aspiration towards the beauty of the gods. Well, it's the myth of Icarus, whose ingenious wings melted as he flew too close to the sun, that undergirds these elements in their arrangement. And Rauschenberg, in fact, explicitly acknowledged that inspiration in his later years. Even the postcard of the Empire State Building, which symmetrically answers the downward tip of the feather, stands as the then highest ascent of the skyscraper, which is precisely what Icarus briefly became before his father Daedalus's fatally hubristic ambition led, sent him plummeting to earth and to death. Through all the themes of painting with gray wing, um, we can identify precedents, including ones that I've discussed earlier in this talk, in his earlier combines. But the subtle and comprehensive organization devoted to this particular restatement of comes as something of a surprise, that he could do that. The viewer is put on his or her medal. Um, as few of the motifs of the work offer any release from the myth's underlying structure. There's almost no remainder, and what remainder there is announces itself as such. I think of the many modern poets who sought to recuperate ancient mythology, it would be difficult to name one who has surpassed the success in that endeavor achieved by Rauschenberg here. Literary myths, as I noted earlier, offer secondary narrative rationalizations of atemporal arrays of opposed terms. In this case, authority versus aspiration, artifice versus nature, order versus disorder, the human versus the more than human. Perennial and irresolvable dilemmas that constitute the deep texture of human culture. Oral and literary renditions must simplify and sacrifice the density with which these oppositions overlay one another in mythical thought. 
the reason why they must be told over and over again, often with different casts of characters and turns of events. Rauschenberg packed his small canvas with all the matter required for dozens of teased out tales, his means inherently more capable of approximating the essentially spatial character of mythical structure. Both the freshness and ultimate persuasiveness of the exercise hinge upon these recognitions emerging from materials that bear next to none of the piously decorous or cultivated trappings with which classical antiquity has come to be freighted. Now the actual undoing of Icarus is absent from Painting with Grey Wing, but casting an eye over his previous body of work, uh, one catches a glimpse of the event along the central axis of Gloria from 1956, where Rauschenberg placed a photograph isolated by this mostly blank uh, expanse uh, of a tiny figure hurtling backwards and head first against a huge featureless sky. This is in fact a stunt parachutist suspended in a moment before the release of his canopy. So the theme of the parachute, which, which is almost endemic through Rauschenberg's work, is here by implication, but in a, this Icarian tragic mode. That fleeting vision, which is on the verge of vanishing, underscores the degree to which subjectivity arrives in the combines under multiple signs of its disappearance, with the supplemental extinguishing of youth and beauty in the bargain. In combines begun early and late, we thus encounter the same tight conjunction between fantasies of flight, their rare success and usual frustration, bound up with emblems of love, encompassing nearly all of its potential objects, generational or gender. The repeated actions and up upward aspirations figured in these works imply some sort of agent who repeatedly undertakes them and in turn typically suffers, falls back to earth. Bookending the first half decade of the Combine period are Rauschenberg's two moments of greatest explicitness in subject matter. At the beginning, there were all those abundant autobiographical references, the confessional mode, which more or less goes. And at the end, those are balanced by overt, unmistakable invocation of classical myth a distinct phase that includes alongside Painting with Grey Wing, the wheeled gift for Apollo, which uses its trailing suspended bucket to conjure the hapless falling Phaeton, who tried to drive his father's tempestuous horses across the sky, cognate to Icarus with the roles of the fathers reversed. Daedalus sent Icarus into the air, Apollo warned him, warned Phaeton not to, but the fates turned out to be the same. The Kuros-like pale for Ganymede plays against both victims of hubris as this beautiful young mortal ascends to the heavens and never returns, becoming the cupbearer to the gods after having been abducted by Jupiter, a theme Rauschenberg repeated in Canyon of the same year with its powerful Jovian eagle and captive pillow suspended in the shadow of the raptor's outstretched wings. You know, the slides are looking better. <laughs> it, it requires no particular inclination toward arcane speculation to discern the reappearance of, in these, these, this cluster of works of bird flight as an organizing preoccupation, transposed from the comic ineffectuality of the flightless hens to a heroic, tragic mode, intervening between the human and the divine. 
Though evocations of classical and Renaissance art were there from the beginning, the repetitive drama enacted throughout these later combines achieved a, a, a new concision and a new comfort with large themes. Now, for all the personal predispositions that might have pushed Rauschenberg toward these sorts of solutions, his move into explicit allegories was no autobiographical symptom. It was instead a considered aesthetic choice aimed at making indisputably major work during a period of transition and uncertainty that affected many other artists besides himself. Once he had set his universe of migratory symbols into motion, he would find his choices kind of guided or constrained by the tendency of those symbols to behave in certain ways and not in others, a phenomenon foreshadowed by the uncanny power he sensed in his personal fetishes. So the evolution of the combines could be described in stages. First, we might see his flight from the compulsory unity as a master aesthetic, which the previous generation had, had lived by, toward maximized proliferation and multiplicity of signs, which that first combine definitely displays. Then, as no condition of true randomness can ever be sustained, regularities begin to appear. Features like the levitating chicken, perhaps selected casually at the outset, emerge as newly stable artifacts and other points of convergence, like the fall of Icarus or the judgment of Paris, translate clusters of charged elements into more familiar second order narratives. The artist's growing awareness of correspondences to literary allegories of the past then feed back into these emerging patterns. Successive iterations of his evolving system, which is to say every combine that came along, altered the terms by which repeated or novel elements functioned in both their earlier and later appearances. And such behaviors underlie allegory's world-creating functions, such that the artist, while setting the initial conditions of the allegorical process and guiding its unfolding, finds himself nonetheless becoming subject to it, subject in turn to the agents and forces that come to live within the allegorical system. That the keys to apprehending the combines are tacit rather than explicitly stated has led many professional observers to discount their presence, that is to discount the presence of any logic or order or meaning to Rauschenberg's procedures. But in 1959, he was making plain that his implicit allegories bore comparisons to some of the most central, and potent mythological narratives, and then to a titanic monument in the whole history of the form the divine comedy of Dante. Over a year or more, he undertook to produce one illustration for every one of the 34 cantos in the Inferno. Planned from the start according to an explicit program of depiction, it would seem to, you know, to depend on the text, to be a matter of secondary effect or secondary illustration but in his actual manner of making these illustrations, a play of subtle, unexpected effects erupts across their surfaces, produced not by the supple brush of painting tradition, but by a surrogate procedure, his manually rubbing over cut-out magazine fragments, soaked in lighter fluid, so as to transfer the printer's ink to the sheet beneath. The result was a blurred, semi-liquid flux of color animated with more vigorous striations of his stylus, often just a dry ballpoint pen, 
both of which lent the artist familiar heterogeneity of sources a newly fluent formal unity. Under its known literary rubric, no element in these drawings need stand out sufficiently as, uh, to function as a key to the others. So the raw substance of the combine assemblages could be dispensed with in favor of, of smooth surfaces and virtual space. Protracted labor over the Dante drawings took Rauschenberg away from his New York haunts to an isolated retreat on the Florida coast. That, um, God, I suddenly had the thought that that music might be coming from an iPhone, but it's not. <laughs> that withdrawal was itself an adventure. As a visiting John Cage later recalled, at night looking for help, I'm walking through a land infested with rattlesnakes. So the perils of the, uh, of the pilgrimage of Dante and Virgil somehow had a literal correlative on this little island that um, Rauschenberg had more or less retreated to in the wake up of his difficulties with Jasper Johns. He had armed himself with little but piles of magazines from the Henry Booth stable, Time, Life, Sports Illustrated, that is the most mainstream American repertoire of advertising and editorial photography. So these are Russian weightlifters who stand in for the giants of this, uh, of this uh, canto. And he fashioned each sheet as a direct reaction to his first encounter with the canto in question, often read to him by someone else. Not until a given drawing was finished did he go on to the next. But each step in his self-taught acquisition of classical learning led to the need for more. As 1959 also saw, as we've seen, that distinctive classical turn in his parallel production of new combine sculptures, Canyon, Pale for Ganymede, Gift of Apollo, Painting with Grey Wing. Arguably more than any other literary work, Dante's verse had performed the central allegorical label, labor, of reconciling two opposed systems of knowledge, Christian eschatology with the pagan iconography of the underworld. Likewise, it rendered high Latin learning compatible with a robust vernacular language, all of these commonplaces, of course. But the poem further provides the consummate template for an obstructed quest by a flawed everyman in search of redeeming beauty at its conclusion, which was exactly, as Rauschenberg must have recognized, the master narrative of the combines. So thank you very much and for your kind attention. That's the end of the journey. <laughs> of these very complicated works. I, for one, have several questions, but I want to open it up first um, to see if anybody else has any others. Matt. Sure. I'm wondering, Ned Black now in college, did, did Rauschenberg study literature with, with Olsen or Crowley or other guys? Were there great interdisciplinary the two that knew so much about Rauschenberg? He, he certainly did in the informal way that, you know, that things proceeded at Black Mountain. I don't think there was anything on offer there that he was not curious about and exposed himself to. Um, but words were a big problem for him. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, they had maybe a kind of negative magic or aura as far as he was concerned. Um, he did manage to write that statement for the Florentine exhibition, though, so it, it was something he could overcome, but in general, he would kind of slide off to something that he could do, um, you know, in a nonlinear way or in a sort of performative way. I mean, that, that kind of narrative he was 
he was very comfortable with and enjoyed and was part of some of the experiments with the first happenings before they were called that, which occurred at Black Mountain, which incurred, included Cage's, uh, you know, four minutes and 33 seconds, the, the, the silent piano piece, and, and in which the white painting was, was displayed at the same time. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking of that. Um, I think that's a, that's a very sound intuition. Uh, one of the things that I left out for reasons of time was the, his first major project, which he did in collaboration with Susan Weil, which I'm sure you know about, which are the blueprint, uh, um, well, prints. Their, their life, the people would lie on them, and he would use blueprint paper, you know, which lightens under exposure uh, to uh, light, no, sorry, that um, light. So you would get these sort of spectral um, uh, uh, silhouettes of the models that they would pose on, the, on these great rolls, you know, of blueprint paper. And the fact that he went straight for these kind of monumental figures, uh, or, you know, makes me think about his, his, his loving the blue boy and Pinky, which are just like that. They're, 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 they really are like cut out figures of, you know, of exemplary beauty or panache. And so he would, you know, find these very attractive nude models and put them on the, they would put them on the, uh, on the paper and you would get something equivalent in sort of scale and relationship between the figure to the format. Uh, and, you know, that's not so far from a sense of the autonomous, self-contained, standing classical figure in its way. Um, you know, the Huntington Gardens, I don't know how many people have been to them, of course, have these avenues that are lined with, uh, with standing uh, statuary, and that might have had an effect on him as well. And then how to, well, your real question is, though, how to navigate his relationship with the, just the half generation before him, who he would have discerned, as you're implying, the fact that this uh, legend of sort of uh, uh, spontaneity and uh, in pure inspiration was in fact very carefully prepared for and tended. And uh, so Franz Klein would, uh, prepare his great slashing um, uh, uh, gestures of black on white or white over black by doing careful little studies and then blowing them up on the canvas with an opaque projector, as you were saying, and then following that pattern with a sweeping gesture, but n having a guide to how that sweeping gesture would proceed. So that the logic of reproduction and um, you know, a, a, a kind of qualified originality was there that both he and Johns would definitely bring out as the foregrounded effects of their art. So I think that's exactly right. My answers are too long. <laughs> no, I have a question which is more about the role um, of the, this trip of Rome, yeah. let's say Rome in particular, as that's where we are. Um, there are certainly traces and evocations of myth everywhere you go, but mm -hmm. I wonder if in your knowledge of 
where things that Rauschenberg may have visited during his time here, if there are particular, uh, what was the evocation of Rome, his Rome, and how that perhaps contributed to this um, evolution of the combines in the years just following that trip? Um, well, you know, there are uh, the attributions of, of, of classical sculpture are kind of notoriously fluid, aren't they? And, um, uh, you know, Ganymedes and Mercuries and um, any, any sort of Antinous types often were renamed according to uh, uh, divine or quasi-divine figures who uh, exemplified perfect ephebic beauty. And it's interesting that those themes uh, up to and including Apollo, of course, as the master uh, representation of those values are so, uh, you know, so much the, 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 the norm within that 1959 group of, of sculptures. So there wouldn't be any shortage of, of you go to the Capilano Museum where they obviously were, that's where he took the picture of Twombly. Um, you would find lots of, of examples like that. And you know the story of Antinous and Hadrian and so on would have been something they would have really, really warmed to. With the tragic drowning, you know, I just thought of that. Didn't Antinous drown in the Nile? Um, so there you go. <laughs> Thank you again for this oh, great talk. My pleasure. Um.